Greetings, Culture Warriors. It is I, Jeff Fiera, the author of Culture is Everything, and your host for this latest Dispatch from the Front. Back to the banking world today. This Bloomberg story by Peter Chapman. Credit Suisse faces Belgian probe over hidden accounts. Credit Suisse Group AG faces a criminal probe amid suspicions it helped more than 2,600 clients to hide money in Swiss accounts, Belgian prosecutors said. Investigators are looking for evidence of money laundering and whether the Swiss lender acted as an illegal financial intermediary, Eric Van Dyce, a spokesman for Belgian, Belgium's financial Belgium's federal prosecutor's office, said Monday, confirming comments by an official cited by Leco newspaper over the weekend. He said the probe is at the fact-gathering stage and it's not a certain it will result in formal charges. Prosecutors obtained the bank details of Belgian clients with Credit Suisse accounts between 2003 and 2014, Van Dyce confirmed. Authorities received account data from French authorities last year, he added. Credit Suisse applies a strict zero-tolerance policy and wishes to conduct business with clients who have paid their taxes and fully declared their assets, the lender said in an August 22nd emailed statement. We strictly comply with all the applicable laws, rules, and regulations in the markets in which we operate. Swiss banks have been caught up in global tax crackdowns over the past decade as the country's tradition of banking secrecy came under siege. The COVID-19 pandemic delayed UBS Group AG's appeal of a conviction and record 4.5 billion euro, that's $5.3 billion, penalty for helping wealthy French clients stash undeclared funds in offshore accounts. So a fairly simple story on the face of it, kind of misleadingly simple. I'm going to pull a couple of facts to the fore for your consideration before we dive deeper, as is our want, into the values and cultural aspect of this. First off, I want to speak to something mentioned towards the end of the article, the reputation of Swiss banks, the country's tradition of banking secrecy. Switzerland and its banks long ago decided the one aspect of the country's official neutrality in European affairs is that its banking systems would operate more or less on a don't ask, don't tell basis. The money comes in, the money gets held, the money goes out. No questions asked. And as such, Swiss banks became a magnet for funds that people were looking for. Now, why might different folks in Europe and elsewhere be seeking certain funds? Well, it could be that uh, they are these funds were being hidden from taxation. So as socialism has infected much of Europe, with its exorbitant taxation schemes, the wealthy were incented to hide as much of their wealth in offshore accounts as possible to protect it from taxation such that they wouldn't see a big chunk of their nest egg evaporate and be sent to the money-grubbing socialist state. That's one application for it. In the post-war world, Those Nazis who escaped justice needed a place to put their money. Many of them wound up in Argentina, but Latin American banks are not very well known for their stability. So where do you hide all those newly laundered Deutschmarks that you need to hide from the Israelis and others? Well, you seek out Swiss banks. Because their don't ask, don't tell policy applies even to those of a certain Hitlerite stripe. How about the leaders of tin pot dictatorships across this glistening globe of ours? You know, sometimes it pays 
to have a little security. And given that eventually your peasants and pitchforks will tire of you, as say Muammar Gaddafi's did, if you can avoid being dragged through the streets and hung from a lamppost like Mussolini for your crimes against humanity, well, perhaps you can get to a chartered airliner. And uh, if you manage to squirrel away enough of the wealth that you've extracted from the slaves that you called your people, then you can make a pretty nice post exile life for yourself as a matter of fact you'll need some of that money because in order to put up with you some comp some country somewhere is probably going to require a lot of cash on the barrel head it's a lot of trouble to host exiled dictators and so that can be a reason for swiss banks to be utilized another reason notice the dates on the inquiry that they're looking at here. It's 2003 until 2014. It's really interesting because 2003 was about when the anti-money laundering laws kicked in in earnest, whereby the banking system sought to close off the various international hidey holes where terrorist organizations and other criminal enterprises could launder their money. Where they could take the proceeds of bank robberies and hijackings and kidnappings and turn them into a wonderfully clean, ready-to-spend greenbacks or Krugerrands or, I suppose, rubles. And Swiss banks, during this time period, would have been particularly attractive for that since most of the rest of the world had put a stop to such banking secrecy. So it really makes you wonder as to who these clients are and what they were up to, these 2,600. Why were they looking to stash their money? Were they simply trying to save part of their wealth for their descendants? Or were they up to something a little more nefarious? The Belgian authorities certainly seem to think so. But given the Belgian authorities themselves have proven during their time at the EU to be some of the biggest crooks on the planet, one just can't say. Another interesting potential source of this uh, surge in Swiss banking could be Chinese company owners who are looking to cash in on their wealth outside of the communist regime. A number of these folks have been caught with nest eggs overseas and plans to flee to them at the appropriate time. In fact, we could now be seeing an exodus of such leaders given their premier's crackdowns and power gathering. So there's another potential source of clients for Swiss banking firms like Credit Suisse. Now, what does it say about our values and culture in this regard? Well, number one, you have to look at how do you perceive law and order? Now, in free countries where corruption is low, law and order is esteemed quite highly. And so they seek to turn off these banking avenues to avoid criminals from benefiting from their criminality. Other regimes, however, where corruption is the name of the game, they value having a quiet, off-the-books location where wealth can be accumulated far from the prying eyes of the party and the people. 
and it's their pension plan, if you will. Should those Black Marias come in the night to take them off to wherever the latest gulag is. So there's a little bit different perspective on there. Those banks are a lifeline, a way out. And in some cases, if you want to avoid violent revolution, if you want to avoid civil wars, sometimes it makes sense to allow those things to happen in order to peacefully extract a dictator from his country. Immediately, the Shah of Iran comes to mind, who was given basically safe passage out of Iran when the mullahs came to power, rattling their sabers. Now, in retrospect, would it have been better to leave him be and perhaps inspire a counter-revolution? Eh, possibly. But at the time, the thinking was that Iran would quiet down and perhaps the revolution would fail for lack of having the Shah to string up. There's a certain appeal to that line of thinking, even if it so infrequently proves to be correct. I think in the post-9-11-2001 world, that we have to make it very difficult for terrorists to ply their trade. And that banking secrecy, where it is absolute, is definitely going to draw a significant share of terrorist dollars because it requires a lot of effort given the current anti-money laundering laws and the compliance of the major banks to do it. Uh, when you look at AML law, basically, the amount that triggers concern is about $10,000. Well, when you're a terrorist organization running on tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars, it can be quite painful to try and extract it in less than $10,000 increments at a time. You have to devote a lot of resources to doing that. And a terrorist group without money is a terrorist group that's pretty ineffective. One of the ways that you get suicide bombers is with the promise that their family will be economically cared for. If there's no money, there's no promise. And you have to rely on 72 virgins in the afterlife and the sort of people whom will strap on a bomb given that incentive. It makes their lives a lot more difficult. You have to generally move these people around a lot, all over the globe. That costs money. You have to train them. You have to feed them. You have to clothe them. You have to pay for their YouTube accounts. Well, I guess YouTube is relatively free, but um, you at least got to buy camera equipment, right? So you have legit expenses for your illegitimate enterprise, and that money has to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, the Saudi bank doesn't have branches in many of the company in many of the countries in which these terrorists operate. So how will they draw on their accounts? So I think in this case. Whereas certainly you can respect the notion of having a place somewhere on this globe, a country, the banks in which will take your money and keep it safe for you with no questions asked, a refuge from the thieving, scheming hands of socialist governments. Well, when you have those, you also have to factor in the fact that the very people trying to kill you may avail themselves of it. And so you have to pick your poison. And certainly since 9-11-2001, it has seemed wiser to err on the side of not allowing 
bad guys to bank. Keep an eye on this. We'll see how it continues to play out. Um, but I don't believe that this will be the last such legal case brought to try and put an end to banking secrecy. Have a great day.